So the reading is from Micah 5, 2 to 5a. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Thank you, Sonia. So, maybe a well-known passage to you, maybe not. But it's one that um, we tend to just hear around Christmas. And it's written by the prophet Micah. Now, Micah was um, a bit like John the Baptist in the sense that he prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah. And he did this through his prophetic words. And his prophecy is a vision for a life, to live, a life lived in God's presence. And it's this vision that we need to keep in our thoughts as we remember both Christ's birth on that first Christmas and his second coming at some point in the future. And before I continue, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, often when we read passages from the prophets in the Old Testament, there's a lot that we don't really understand because there are so many layers to it. We can read it simply and get one interpretation, but we know often that there's other things that you've got to say to us through it. We pray that you will give us insight through your Holy Spirit today as we share some ideas on this passage together. Amen. So, as I say, Micah's prophecy included both the first and the second coming of Jesus. And in it, he identifies Bethlehem Ephrathah. Now, Ephrathah was a very small clan in the tribe of Judah. That little town's life and struggles are compared to the birth pangs of a woman in labor. Very apt from the news I gave recently. In ancient cultures, and even now, in many, in many parts, the woman's status in secular and religious society was almost zero, if not zero. Not only the town, but also the heroine of Micah's, Micah's prophecy, a small, of little note, of no significance in civil and religious life. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would come in the majesty of the name of Yahweh, his God. In the culture of Micah's time, a person's name was more than the label to identify him or her. Something of that person's identity was considered to be tied up in that name. The belief was that the person's name expressed something of the person's character. Something of the power of that person was embedded in their name. Jesus fits into this belief. Jesus was God in human form with all God's character and power. Now, the Old Testament is a trail that leads to the Messiah. God gives us clear clues in the scriptures so we can recognize the true Messiah when he comes. These same signs were given to the people in Old Testament times so that they would know when and where Christ would be born. So why then did God choose an insignificant person such as Mary to bear his son? Why did God choose Bethlehem as Jesus' birthplace? Well, encouragingly to us, God chooses ordinary people, places and things to do extraordinary things for him. You see, with God, we must expect the unexpected. It was prophesied that Bethlehem would be Jesus' birthplace. 
and that prophecy was fulfilled on the first Christmas. So where we're from is not nearly as important as what God is creating us to be. God is a God of surprises. He addresses impossible situations in the most unlikely ways. In the case of the birth of Jesus, God acts small. His plan was for the Messiah who would deliver the people to come from Bethlehem, which was the birthplace of David's father, Jesse. Now, when we look through the Christmas story, we read about the Magi from the east coming to Jerusalem, expecting to find the king of the Jews. And King Herod's scribes quote this passage from Micah as evidence that the Messiah is to be born in in Bethlehem. So Jesus reigns at God's request, and it was prophesied that Jesus would be a descendant of David. Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus' rule and protection of his people was the result of God's authority and power. That rule, protection, and authority are for all who believe in Jesus so that they can live with him without fear. They will be united. Now, I've said that God uses the ordinary. The word small has come up in the fact that Bethlehem Ephrata was a small place. Mary was a young girl. And yet, often in the Bible, we see this situation taking place where the youngest is chosen. Whereas, strictly speaking, it's the older brother who gets the birthright. But where the youngest is chosen, we have Jacob getting the birthright and the blessing. Joseph is exalted over his brothers. David is overlooked until all his brothers have been paraded before Samuel. Then finally, he's called in from the pastures surrounding Bethlehem to stand before the prophet and be anointed king. See, the unlikely and the most significant are exalted by God. Bethlehem is like a, like a backwater, a very small place. We think back to um, a passage that we read earlier, well, last year, where we were learning about Nathaniel. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? For he was down in himself because he came from Nazareth. So can anything good come out of Nazareth or Bethlehem? Well, it's a judgment both on the town and on those who live there. We might say, can anything good come out of Sunbury? Can anything good come out of Staines or Twickenham or wherever you might live? But in the case of Bethlehem and those who came from her, the old biblical pattern holds true. The insignificant are exalted, the tables are turned, and the most unlikely of people are instruments of God's salvation. From this insignificant little village, a young shepherd boy grows up to become the most beloved king in Israel's history. And the descendant of that king fulfills God's long-awaited promises of deliverance, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. The world is constantly searching for peace. But that search is an empty one. Instead of looking to Jesus, the world looks to drugs, alcohol, money, and relationships. These do not provide peace. They only provide turmoil. How many lives have been ruined by drugs and alcohol? How many marriages have suffered because of drugs or alcohol, abuse or adultery? True peace can never be found in worldly pleasures. True peace can only be found by knowing Jesus, the long prophesied Prince of Peace. 
and he stands with open arms waiting to welcome us. Not just to welcome royalty, not just to welcome the rich and famous, but to welcome little old me and little old you or little young you. No one is excluded. No one is too small or insignificant for Jesus to welcome them. Because Jesus offers peace to the hearts of those who turn to him and love him. Do you think of yourself as a small person? Not necessarily physically, but in your standing in society or maybe in the church. Do you think that you're just an insignificant person? You come and you sit on the chair on a Sunday and you go home again, but you're not really fully part of the church in your opinion. Well, you see, God sees that. God sees each of us as we really are. And he doesn't say, oh, that's all right. You carry on being like that. He wants you to be a true part of his family. He's not going to push you, but his desire is that we are together like a family. Now, even in a family, we get quiet people maybe and noisy people. In my family, when I was growing up, I was the quiet one. My sister was the noisy one. And a lot of the time, I just wouldn't bother to say anything because I couldn't get a word in sometimes. And in a sense, it's still true. If I want to speak, tell her something important now, I say, Linda, don't talk until I've finished. And then I'll blurt out what I want to say to her. I'll get her response, and then I'll carry on listening. That's often what happens. But does that mean I'm less significant in the family than her? Not all. There were just us two girls in my family. We were loved equally and yet loved according to our personality by our parents. They dealt with us differently because we are quite different. Is that the same in your family? I'm sure it is. So you see, God knows what each one of us is like. He knows the things that we find easiest, the things we struggle with. So if you are a person who thinks of yourself as being that small, insignificant nobody, nobody will notice me, I can just be there. Have a think about what your heart's desire really is. You see, when I used to be so quiet, my desire was to be much more fully involved. And now, look what I'm doing. I get up and I preach and I lead. That was my desire years ago to do that. But I never said anything to anybody. I had to wait until the last few years to get to that point. Maybe if I'd been bold and I'd said to someone years ago, could I have a go at preaching or leading a service? Things might have been different. But I don't regret at all the time it's taken me because it's been a real learning experience. Now, I know not everybody would want to stand up and preach. Some people say to me that would be the scariest thing they could imagine. But is there something that you feel God is calling you to and you haven't quite plucked up the courage to say anything to anyone because you think you're small and insignificant? Over the next few weeks, months, even years maybe, pray about it. Talk to somebody you really trust in church or your family about it. And let's see how God can change your life and use you in a more significant way than he does now. So Jesus stands before us today. Our only hope and he's calling us to follow him. You may feel that your life is a storm at the moment, but invite him into the storm. Let the light shine in the darkness. This New Year's Day, celebrate that he's come for you 
and know that the peace which passes all understanding is yours. Kirsty, would you like to come up, please? And I'm just going to say a prayer for us now. Father, in your word, in Ephesians, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And we acknowledge before you today, Jesus, that often we do belittle ourselves and we see ourselves as not being important or that someone else is always going to be better at doing something than us. Give us eyes to see ourselves as you see us and help us to step into those things that you've got planned especially for us that is a perfect fit for us as people and individuals. Thank you that you have only the best intentions for us and that even though there are millions of people in this world, that you know the plans for every single one of us. And we thank you so much for that. Amen.